Okay, uh, today we are doing an experiment. Um, this is a, it is a country sourdough loaf, but I'm cutting it with 60% uh, bread flour, 30% uh, um, whole wheat, and 10% einkorn, which uh, I like einkorn, but I've never actually baked with it before. So this is uh, definitely an experiment. Uh, I have no idea how that anything's gonna go. Uh, so what I have here is my initial setup. Uh, mixing bowl, and it's actually the lid for the mixing bowl. Um, got to do the weighing uh, for some things. Uh, got my starter here, right there. Uh, salt, got the water, and all the flour. You can see the uh, different cuts. Maybe the camera might show it, might not. Um, can see it all. Uh, so uh, what I'm doing is a, a 500 gram loaf, which is um, for home baking, it's it's plenty. It's it's just enough to um, last a week for uh, one person, uh, depending on how often you eat bread. Uh, two people, if you you know, not that often, but that that's okay. Uh, so 500 grams of flour. Uh, in this case, because I was using more whole wheat and uh, even 40% uh, whole wheat mix, um, the einkorn is also whole wheat, um, just a different variety. Uh, I decided to go with 80% hydration today. Uh, and see how that goes because normally when I do higher uh, uh, amounts of wheat in in the loaf like 50 60 sometimes 100 percent even I've got to increase the hydration a lot to get that to work because uh, it just you know you got the, the the germ and the bran and all the, the fiber and all the good stuff in the wheat uh, what happens there is it uh, it just sucks up the water and it just it needs the extra it just needs the water um, salt is, uh, uh, 10 grams of that, um, 2% for the mix entirely. Uh, if I missed the water before, that was, uh, 375 grams of that, which is, um, it, again, 80% hydration there and 500 grams of flour total, uh, with, with it being, uh, percentages, um, 10%, uh, uh, 60% and 30% total. There, I'll, uh, I'll post all this down in the um, description below. And then I'm going to use 100 grams of starter. Um, interesting thing about the starter, which is actually just my um, Levon for baking. Uh, in this case, I have, uh, I only need 100 grams, but I, I make a little more just in case, and I can use the discard for other things. Um, I'm not going to show me prepping the starter. I've been running this particular starter I've had for three years. Keep it going all that time. Um, now you don't have to keep it that long. I mean, even professional bakers restart and redo and create new starters all the time. Um, if you keep one for 50 years, you are a miracle worker in my opinion. Uh, I'm lucky I've gotten this one for three. <laughs> so it's very good. Additionally, one other thing about this starter that I think um, uh, is important is I tend to go more with the, the tartine method. Uh, they use a young Levon when they uh, do their bakes, and their Levon is only two hours, so they feed it, and then two hours later, they're already using it for a bake. Um, I found for me that doesn't really work too well. Uh, I find it just doesn't give me the rise I'm looking for. And uh, you'll hear a lot of different YouTubers out there and a lot of professionals. They'll tell you, oh, you want to hit it at peak. If it's past peak, you, you know, it might be no good anymore. Or you can still use it past peak. Or do a young Levon, do this. Look, just find out what's best for you. That, that, that's, that's the best advice anyone can give you. Try different things. Figure out which one works best for you. Now on mine, with my, with my Levon here, what I'll do is a four hour, uh, it's young, but not as young as say Tartines. Uh, I do four hours. And in fact today, which is unusual because it's January, um, even in Southern California where I live, um, <laughs> it actually rose really fast. It more than doubled its size. You don't see it now because I've been swashing it around a little bit while I'm talking. Uh, and it, it uh, kind of, you know, the gas kind of fizzled out of it a little, but it's still very good. It's, it's a young Levon and it's great. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do fine on this bake and I use that all the time. Uh, so what we're going to do first is we're going to mix the ingredients. Um, what I, now I may have a slightly different technique than others. I actually prefer to uh, get the starter in uh, and then mix it with the water first. That's the first thing I do. Uh, and then I put the flour in after that. And the reason I do it that way is I find it's just easier for me in particular to uh, work with it. it. And it gives it a more, in my opinion, it just gives it a more uniform distribution because you're using the water to kind of dilute the starter a little bit 
uh, and that just kind of helps spread it around the dough. But you do not have to do it that way. Uh, there's many, many w different techniques. Feel free to you, you know, just go on YouTube, and just search sourdough, and there you go. You know, you'll find a thousand different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, and it's all good. It's all good. Do whatever works best for you is, is uh, generally um, the best best approach. Uh, so right now I need to measure out 100 grams of the starter for this because I need I, that's what I need for this bake. And just tear it really quick. There we go. There we go. All right. So we're going 100 grams of, uh, of my starter. I, I may be switching between starter and Levon. To me, it's the same thing. I'm not a professional. I'm just... You know, it is my starter, but it's set up for a bake, so it's a Levon. I, I, you know, whatever. Read the books, follow other YouTubers, just whatever whatever approach you want to take with what you call it is up to you. I, I, that's just what I'm doing. Uh, you can't see, but uh, underneath the mixing bowl is where I've got my scale. And I'm just about on it. There we go. All right. We've got that in. Just getting, just getting things out of the way. Uh, you know, it's a small space. And we don't actually need this anymore because everything, all my ingredients were pre-measured except for the starter because that one you just kind of have to have to do. Uh, with the water, uh, room temperature, uh, what I do is once I create the Levon for the bake, I also just pour all, uh, measure and pour all the water into just a, it's a little Ziploc container, easy peasy. And uh, I just pour it in there and uh, just let it warm up to room temperature for four hours and it's ready to go. Um, that's the easiest way I can control the temperature on the water. Otherwise, you're dealing with, you know, a stovetop or a microwave or a refrigerator or a freezer. And it's just, it's a waste of time. This is easy. All right. So we're just going to, we're going to pour most of the water in. But not all of it. And the reason is, I like to hold a tiny bit back, like just a tiny smidge, like 10, 15, 20 grams, depending, and I don't measure that part, but I hold it back because what I do later, you'll see this later in the video, but when I add the salt and I uh, uh, get that in there, it helps with the salt <laughs> to do it that way. Um, it kind of, you know, wettens up the dough a little, lets the salt get absorbed a little bit better. It's just easier to do. The salt also slows down the feeding time and the, the, the growth and the proofing and all that a little bit. So what I do first is I mix everything together and then I auto lease. So I will try and include stuff like that right in the uh, description below to explain some of these details. I might even give you my recipe. It's actually on a Google sheet. Um, and I change the recipe around all the time when I'm trying things. So I'll probably just give you the country uh, sourdough plus einkorn version for this one. Einkorn, sorry, version for this one. See uh, if we get a decent bake out of it anyway. Otherwise, this will just be a failed experiment. And you all get to see me screw that up. All right. Oh, by the way, this, uh, if you can see it, is actually not anything. I just use that for dusting later. All right. So I've got the... Um, and sorry if I'm talking very fast. This is kind of one of the earliest videos I've done, and uh, there's just a lot in my head to remember at the same time. I will try and slow my speech down, talk a little better. But here we are. Okay, so it's all mixed in. Now we're going to add the flour and uh, have fun with it. Alright, just mix it together. That's it. That's the whole plan for this. And it will stick to your hands. It sticks to mine. <laughs> See? Like, it's already sticking to my hands like crazy. But that's alright. Alright, so I've got the dough, you know, mixed. And just making sure there's no dry spots anywhere. A little piece of it flung out. Uh, this stage is the messiest. Uh, dough likes to stick to my hands in general, and, uh, well, that's no, even worse when I do rye bread. Um, I, I can't even use my hand when it's rye bread because it, it will not come off my hands no matter what I do, and it's just nuts. But, uh, with this, uh, it'll stick to your hands a lot at this stage because you're just getting everything together, but... It will, it will get easier, particularly with practice. You start to learn more, more techniques and, and just figure things out as you go. Uh, and it, it, you know, it keeps the, you know, things that will just keep the dough from sticking to your hand like that. Um, all 
Now you don't see me stretching and pulling or doing any of that just yet because right now all I've done is just mix the dough together just trying to get into a little bit of a you know setup here. I'm not going to worry about you know tension and all that stuff just yet. That's what I'll work on later uh, as the gluten structure builds inside the dough. That's what that's that's what happens. And right now what we're going to do is go and as soon as I find it and <laughs> get the there we are get the lid on here and we're going to leave it for about uh, an hour. All right, so this part the auto lease is done. I'm going to take the lid off of here or I'm going to try anyway. You can see it's still a bit of a shaggyish kind of setup. That's a okay. It's perfectly fine. I may even discover that uh, it's not hydrated enough. That's okay too. I'll go figure all those things out as I go. Um, right now what we're going to do is we're going to do the mixing of the salt and the remaining water. And um, this is going to start the, the bulk fermentation process and the stretching and the folding that happens uh, after this. I usually run them about every half hour. I do four of those. So as part of the bulk what I'll do is I'll mix all this in then every 30 minutes for four four times i will do a stretch and fold uh, which helps build up the gluten structure helps get the dough ready uh, to truly bulk ferment and, and start its rise uh, as as the yeast uh, you know the natural yeast from the starter and the levon uh, work their way in so uh, right now what we're going to do is we're going to put the salt in and the water in and get that all mixed up and then we will um, I will probably transfer it to my other container as well, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. And as you can see, the, the dough is wetter. It's not sticking to my hands yet so much. Uh, but that's going to happen as I mix the dough in a little more, the water, it starts absorbing the water, the salt and everything. What's going to happen is I'm going to do stretch and folds every 30 minutes and each time it's going to be less and less sticky and it's going to be, the dough is going to work itself a little better as it goes. So what I'm doing right now, I'm getting the water and the salt in there and I'm not really trying to stretch it, but you can see it's really holding itself together now. And that, that was just an auto lease. An auto lease with just, just the basics. It didn't even, you know, nothing going on yet. Um, and as you can see, it's very, uh, it's, it's, because there's a lot more whole wheat in it, what you'll find is it can be a lot, a bit more difficult. Oh, sorry if I'm getting out of the frame there. It can be a little bit more difficult to stretch and fold it first, but as it gets going, it gets easier and easier and easier and better. All right, it's been about half an hour. We're going to do our first stretch and fold and uh, we'll see how that goes in today's world because I am using a slightly different wheat mix this time around. Uh, what I have over here to the side is just a little, another Ziploc or maybe this one's glad or who, who cares? Little cheap plastic things, you get these things at Target. Uh, containers, you just get them at Target. Anyway, there's water in it. Um, just using the water to, to wet my hand a little. Uh, makes it easier to work with the dough, keeps it from sticking, because it is still going to be pretty sticky under normal circumstances. All I'm going to do is I'm going to do a stretch and fold. And um, I do this, I, I kind of cup it in my, heart, uh, my hand and I stretch it out a bit. And it gets a little bit window painty. you can kind of see it there. Uh, you don't have to take it to the point that it rips, in fact you probably shouldn't. I'm not an expert there, go consult a professional. Um, and I just, you know, stretch, fold it in on itself, stretch, fold it in on itself. And already you can see it is stretching quite well, quite well. Uh, sometimes I go a little higher, sometimes I don't. It's okay. You know, practice makes perfect. I haven't actually baked in a while, so I'm probably a little off on the technique. So critique that technique is uh, what I'm going to post this video under. I think that's my playlist for this. Um, that's all you need to do. Just get give yourself a good series of stretch and folds. Uh, you know, if you can do it in quarters, do it, you know, one, two, three, four, and four quarters. I do six or eight usually uh, just to make sure I'm, I'm really getting the stretch in there. And that's it. Done. Now you wait another half an hour and have fun again. And, uh, you know, you can see it, right? It was already easier to work with and it was stretching well. was not really sticking to my hand much. 
That's good. This is all good stuff. All right, see you in 30. A uh, quick note, I just turned the recording off and forgot to mention, uh, and this is just a quick note, um, I'm done with the stretch and folds, it's good, it's, uh, the whole thing is formed, it's, it's, uh, it's looking good, it, it is getting gassy, I need to let it bulk ferment. This can usually take, for me, uh, it can usually take mm, about an hour, sometimes a little longer, um, and it's not so much the time you, you leave it out for, there's a lot of factors that impact it. It could be uh, the temperature range, the, um, the humidity, uh, the time of the year, um, just all sorts of things that might impact how long it takes to bulk ferment. So you're really more looking for something rather than uh, how much, you know, timing it exactly on a stopwatch. Um, sometimes I've gone 45 minutes and it was ready. Sometimes I've gone two hours and it still wasn't ready. Uh, it just depends. It depends on a lot of things. Um, when it is ready, we're going to see a noticeable increase in volume. Uh, this is where I differ from some and some differ from me and others. Um, I'm usually only looking for about 20% increase in volume uh, before I go into uh, pre-shaping. And um, not everyone does it that way. Uh, but I found it tends to work best for me and what I'm trying to do and where I'm at and everything. Uh, that works best for me if I want to get a good rise uh, and start building the tension into the surface of the dough for when I'm ready to actually bake and score the dough so that uh, it comes out a, a good, a good, you know, airy, fluffy, light loaf on the inside, but also a nice crispy brown on the outside. So first thing I'm going to get under it and I'm going to flip it over so that I can uh, stretch it out a little bit and uh, get it shaped. You'll see right here there's a nice big gas bubble just under the surface and it held really well together. All right. Oh yeah, that looks good. And there was a bubble in there. Huh. All right. So what we're going to do right now is we're just going to we're going to spread this out a bit. We're trying not to tear, but there's going to be a few. Uh, it's going to happen. And I'm trying to get a, a bit of a square shape in here, maybe a little triangular. Kind of depends. Um, again, I'm trying to maintain the gassiness as best I can. Uh, there is a lot of uh, whole wheat in here, so it will be a bit thicker uh, when I work as I work with it. That's just part of the process, part of what happens when you have a more heartier whole wheat going on. 
um, you're gonna you're gonna end up in that scenario where it's gonna be a little stiffer and a little harder to work with. That's part of the reason you want a higher hydration. All right, so I got it fairly well stretched out. So what I want to do now is, and, and it's a little thicker here in the middle. It is what it is. But um, if I keep working, it's just gonna go too far. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm not the expert. I, I am. I mean, I am an expert, but I'm working it. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stretch that out, right? And I'm gonna just put it into the center. I'm gonna stretch that side out, get it into the center, and that's all I'm doing with it. I'm gonna do the same thing down here. I'm gonna stretch it out a bit, put it in the center, stretch it out a bit, put it in the center, do my best to kind of get it to close, keep, you know, there's a lot of gas in this one. This is good, but I wanna keep it all together. Now, I've got same thing. Now, I, it's whole wheat, so there's a little bit more interesting things happening here, but same thing. From this side, stretch it out, put it in the center. Stretch it out, put it in the center. All right, and then same thing. Just keep tightening it together, holding it up. Now I'm gonna get it like that and just do this. All right, I'm gonna see how I'm trying to utilize that it's sticking just a little bit to the bench, which is what we want. And it's starting to look a bit more like a pillow. This is good. We want that. Sorry if I keep going off camera, it's just, you know, it's, I go where the dough takes me. <laughs> now, what do I have? I have a good looking pillowcase right here. And I didn't, I didn't ruin anything. It didn't, it didn't tear. Uh, I didn't pop any gas bubbles. Did really good there. So what I'm going to do now is I got, I got my batard. And you know what I'll do? I'll try and do this a little easier for you here. There we go. So I got my batard, I got my dough, and you're just gonna plop it right on in. And the batard is lined with uh, rice flour already. Um, it helps keep, uh, it keeps the dough from sticking to it. And I can see the dough is pretty wet, which is, it's good, it's good, because it's not sticking to me, but it, it is wet and that's good. Um, that's fine the way it is. It's very gassy, it's, it's filling out, it's looking good here. And I think, I think we're gonna end up with a pretty good loaf. The real test for me is always, I, I'm horrible at scoring. <laughs> so uh, I've been trying to, the whole thing with the water earlier was me trying to find a better way to get more tension in the top of the dough, which is currently on the bottom. That's, that's gonna be the top. This is the bottom. Uh, when I get it out of the batar and get ready to bake, this will be on the other side. So this this will be the bottom of it. And it's holding together really well. I, I really like it. Um, another thing to note, uh, batards, you, you want this, but you know, you can have uh, an oval shape like this. You can have a round one. Um, some people just use a bowl, uh, you know, or just a regular old, you know, cheap basket of some kind that you get from like a fast food joint or somewhere. Uh, you know, use what you got. That's, that's the best thing to do. Um, now, I get these. These are Ziploc stretchy thingies. Uh, you can find them at Target or your local supermarket, whatever. Uh, they're very cheap. Um, if you don't have that, maybe you have a shower cap. Now, a lot of people do that too. Uh, and you just put this over the, the batard here to, you know, seals in the flavor, so to speak. Not really. It uh, actually just keeps the moisture in and uh, uh, prevents it from drying out. That's really what it does. Now, uh, if you're doing a hot proof you might need to leave it here, or a warm proof, I guess, a room temperature proof. You might need to leave it here for, I mean, it really depends on your situation. It could be as little as an hour and a half, as much as four hours. Don't know. Uh, what you're going to want to do in those scenarios is you want to give it a poke test with your finger and see how fast it springs back up. If it springs up really fast, it's not going to be ready yet. You want to give it more time. And if it's springs up still kind of fast but a little bit slower you're getting close you may want to check it every 15 or 30 minutes maybe 30 minutes then maybe every 15 minutes to see if it's springing up but it's springing up slow and it is coming back to full if it stays depressed eh, you may have a situation <laughs> um, 
uh, you may have waited too long and maybe it may, may not be recoverable. Who knows? Um, in that case, find one of the experts and, and find out what you should do. Because uh, I've not been in that situation and I don't know. Um, right now, though, I'm going to put this in the fridge. We're going to proof it in the fridge at a cold temperature overnight. And then we are going to bake it first thing in the morning. And that's it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, starting out. Okay, uh, so it's the next day in the morning. I like to bake my bread uh, fresh in the morning on the day I plan to eat it, or at least the first day I plan to eat it. I uh, just like it, like it better that way. Um, so I've got a piece of parchment paper, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, alarm, and got to get the bread out of the fridge. So I'm going to do that next. Alright, so we were proofing overnight, and it it definitely uh, expanded quite a bit, uh, and got a huge gas bubble right there too, uh, and it filled out the basket pretty nice. This this is already a big, it's puffy, it's it's gassy, it's it. I, I I'm fingers crossed or fingers crossed that it's gonna be a a, a good bake. Now, what do I use the parchment paper for? Uh, cause I'm lazy? I don't know. But the real thing here is that, um, the parchment paper for me makes it so I don't have to, like, spread out any semolina flour. Uh, some people use, uh, cornmeal. I don't like that. I hate when people do that with pizzas, too. Um, but what they do that for is, it's a, it's a coarse, uh, semolina in particular is a coarse flour. And it works really well to help keep your, um you know, your, your dough from like, cause I use a pan to slide in and out, uh, keeps it from sticking to the pan, keeps it from sticking to the counter even. So it actually works really well for that. Um, some people just use rice flour for it. Uh, whatever works for you. I just, you know, slap it on a piece of parchment paper and I'm good to go. I don't have to, don't have to, you know, worry. It's easier that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the parchment paper, put it on top of the dough, and then I'm going to do that. Um, this is just easier for me, <laughs> but, uh, do whatever works for you and then boom, just take it off. Now, uh, sometimes the rice flour makes a little bit of a mess. <laughs> so what we're going to do is just grab a brush and just kind of wipe that off. I actually thought I did not have that much rice flour in the banneton yesterday, which I probably forgot to mention is what I lined the banneton with, but, uh, no big deal. And just kind of get that off the parchment paper and need to bake it. All right, there we go. Now, today I am practicing scoring technique. That's why I was changing some of the other stuff up. Uh, yesterday, uh, it was an attempt to practice better scoring. So the things I'm hearing is to kind of keep it like, you know, curved blade, you know, curved, curved blade, don't touch the blade, sharp. Um, Milam does that, makes it easier. Uh, and I've never had, I think once ever I got a good solid ear on my bread and just, it, it, I don't know what I do wrong all the time. So I'm always trying something new with that to see if I can figure out why, you know, why my scoring doesn't work. Uh, it gets a good solid ear. I always get a good oven spring and a good, good rise, but the, the ear is what I have, to, just can't do. Um, so today I'm going to try to use a more kind of a, uh, flattened approach in my technique because you know they always say you know score it uh you know score it in angles do this do that and I'm, I'm just always getting something wrong so I'm gonna try it you know with a more flat kind of approach I also saw a video yesterday from another baker he said actually pull pull the bread a little bit like with your hand in the other direction and score it and that'll create a little bit of extra tension so today that's what we're gonna try And maybe go just a tad. Yeah, that's good. All right, we're going to go with that and see what happens. All right, so there will be some interesting things where I have to move the camera to film the actual uh, baking. So we'll see how that goes.
Okay, uh, we baked, we saw, we got conquered, and also conquered. Uh, so a couple things. Um, it's a very hearty loaf. It got a really good oven spring uh, when we were baking it. Uh, hopefully there was a good enough uh, lighting into the oven to see it. Um, one problem we had is because the oven spring was so good, it's a small oven, uh, the top of the loaf got a little too close to the heating coils. Um, when that happens, you know, it's hard for me to predict outside of the month of July around here. That's when I know stuff like that's going to happen. So um, usually in those cases, I can uh, just lower the temperature of the oven uh, by 25 degrees or so, and that tends to help. Another thing I do is I give, I give a, the loaf a tinfoil hat. I probably should have recognized it a little sooner uh, in the baking process and given it that hat sooner uh, than I did. I waited about 25 minutes. I really shouldn't even have waited 20. Probably 15 minutes was enough to give it that hat. And what the aluminum foil does is it reflects the heat off the direct top of the loaf while still maintaining the radial heat, the uh, convection heat around the loaf so it continues baking. I should have done that. So that part for me was a fail. Got a little bit of a burn up top, but got a good, uh, good bake. Nice, nice walnuty color here. Um, good sound on the bottom of the loaf. I actually managed to get half an ear this time. That's a first for me. Uh, usually I just get it to split and just stay flat and it, it is no ear, no good ear. So I got something today. That's better, better than usual. Uh, I'm going to continue refining the process, uh, the ingredient mix on the flour types, uh, and keep working with this. So this one I'd call a, uh, half win, half fail scenario. Uh, something good, something bad came out of it. So... Uh, as long as the loaf tastes good and, and ultimately it got a good airy center, uh, we're going to be in good shape anyway. So let's cut and see what we got. Oh, look at that. That is a good... That is good. I didn't cut evenly, apparently. Uh, but that is good. Just look at that. I mean, you got half the ear in there. You got nice... Nice pockets of air, good bubble bubble structure in there. Yeah, this was a good bake. This was a good bake. All right, so just going to finish cutting, and uh, that's our loaf for this week. We'll even, uh, you know, before I even do that, I think what I'm going to do is uh, get some, well, yeah. <laughs> so I got the camera above. doesn't quite work that way for what I'm doing, so, yeah, I guess we'll try something like that. I don't know. Anyway, looking for a shot I can make work here. <laughs> Nothing, apparently. Boom. <laughs> 